The Overcast is made possible through the generous donations of our patrons, who are among the most brilliant and wonderful people in the world. If you would like to join them, take a moment, go to patreon.com front slash overcast. Thank you in advance. Welcome to the Overcast, a speculative fiction podcast featuring breathtaking stories from the Pacific Northwest and beyond. I'm your editor and this week's host, J.S. Arquin. Hello and welcome to our... What is this? <laughs> I don't even know. Second! It's our second podcast of March. You see, you get a, a guest host in and it just... I don't even know what month I'm in anymore. <laughs> anyway... Hello, uh, this is J.S. Arquin. I'm back. Uh, did you miss me? I missed you. But at the same time, it was really, really cool getting to listen to the Overcast and Eric guest hosting. Uh, I have to say, I'm really enjoying having all these other voices involved in the Overcast. After uh, almost six years of doing it all by myself, it feels amazing to have a community working with me, uh, I'm very grateful to my team of slush readers and my uh, slush reader slash assistant wrangler, Gabrielle, and my guest host, Eric. Uh, There will be possibly more guest hosts coming, and we'll definitely be having Eric back. And uh, now, today, I get to bring you a guest narrator, and there will also be a lot of those coming up. We've got... Many, many wonderful voices to share with you and pair with our authors here on the Overcast. Oh, and before I get to this week's story, I just have a personal thing to share with you that I'm very excited about. I just found out yesterday afternoon that uh, a book I narrated, the Planet Cider Trilogy by G.J. Ogden, is a finalist for an independent audiobook award in the Apocalyptica category. I am beyond thrilled and honored to be chosen as a finalist for my narration of that trilogy. Uh, It is a science fiction post-apocalyptic extravaganza with zombies and politics and struggle and space and uh, ruined earth and it's a lot of fun. If that sounds like your sort of thing, Give it a listen. That's the Planet Cider Trilogy by G.J. Ogden. All right, I think that's all the side business. Let's get to this week's story. This week, I'm proud to bring you C.R.A.P. by Sherry Shahan. Sherry Shahan writes from a funky beach town in California. Her work has appeared in the Los Angeles Times, Oxford University Press, ZYZZYVA, Exposition Review, The Writer, and is forthcoming in, I don't even know how to pronounce that, F, parentheses, R, Iction. (laughs) She holds an MFA from Vermont College of Fine Arts and taught a creative writing course for UCLA Extension for 10 years. You can find her online at sherryshahan.com. And pairing with Sherry Shahan's story, I am proud to present our first guest narrator, Kate Tierney. Kate Tierney always had a passion for reading aloud, and the shy kids could breathe a sigh of relief every time she volunteered to do so. After attending the University of Albuquerque, Kate received her BFA in theater. She headed off to Los Angeles, where she performed in theater and television. Eventually, she and her husband headed to New York and started a family, and lived there for the past 20 years. But the gypsy in her soul knew it was time for a change. She packed her bags and headed the family west to the endless blue skies of her hometown, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and is now producing audiobooks. C.R.A.P. Criminally Rebellious Adolescent Population by Sherry Shahan Read by Kate Tierney Iris longs to be with others who resist state laws. 
others who risk punishment to express themselves however they choose, others who believe that what a person dreams is more important than exams devised to test how little you know about history. She's been searching for a group she heard about during a blackout. C-R-A-P, Criminally Rebellious Adolescent Population, or CRAP. Supposedly, they live in a crumbling 20th century bomb shelter, playing instruments ripped off from the state repository, assorted brass and drums, a piano with non-synthetic keys. Iris dreams of joining them. She risks venturing above ground, hunkering over the rusty handlebars of a felonious 10-speed, pedaling above the transit tube that links one underground metropolis to the next, sweating inside her black neoprene wetsuit, black skull cap, black combat boots, hoping all her blackness will blend into the inky night. Her guitar is slung over her shoulder. Up here in the messed up ozone, all is as quiet as the day personal transport became illegal. Everyone knows people once lived above ground, drove vehicles with built-in music systems, and made babies in the back seat instead of in petri dishes. That was before the last trumped-up election. Iris immerses herself in a new theory, letting it expand from conjecture to verity. What if state-professed enemies are imaginary? Who would know in a world where lies are passed off as truths and truth is virtually unknown? She wonders why the old and deceased don't rise from beneath the state's tyrannical thumb, break into the repository and steal bikes, skateboards, wheelchairs, anything to propel them down an unbroken line of freedom. What do they have to lose? Her boots beat the pedals, wheels spinning as a drone spirals toward her. If it detects her neural waves, her whereabouts will be transmitted to the state lickety-split. Those who violate curfew disappear for good. She chokes the handlebars, praying the metal frame will interfere with the eye beam, deflecting rays like a shield. The drone moves swiftly, sputtering overhead. We're watching you, crap. You're never out of our sight. Iris ducks as sparks ricochet off the bike rims and singe her wetsuit. The drone oscillates strangely, and then it drops and explodes. The bike protected her. She heads back to her zone, a lone figure among rats with gray, expressionless faces. Tomorrow night, she'll venture further, intent on finding CRAP, now certain they exist. Otherwise, why program a drone with a crap message? Iris pauses near the opening of her underground unit, a steel tunnel that leads to an equally rigid life pod. She turns, hearing the unmistakable melody of a human voice. Who would risk defying the curfew ordinance? She dares to ask. Is anyone there? No answer. Iris swings off her bike, works the front wheel into rubble, ignoring the hum of diagnetics below. It's okay, she says. I'm CRAP, like, certifiably. She senses movement, shuffles closer, and raises two fingers in a primitive peace sign. Hello? Then Iris sees her, a girl about 16, lying on her back, arms crossed over her chest. What shocks Iris most is the neglect of her uniform, which sends a message to the state, up yours, a phrase she learned in her history is fiction class. The girl caresses a pet rat. Iris smiles at her. What are you doing up here? The girl moans. Are you okay? Iris kneels by her side. Finely spun hair frames the most exquisite face she's ever seen. But her eyes are vitreous. Iris has seen that expression before. 
She isn't sure if it's hope or fear. The girl's unruly presence gives Iris courage. Are you CRAP? The girl moans again and sinks further into herself. Iris wonders if being CRAP means you're a little bit crazy. If allowing yourself to feel, like the state says, is the definition of madness. She swings her guitar around and plays a few chords. The girl begins to sob. Please don't cry. If only Iris had learned to sing. But when she relaxes her throat, a discordant quaver seeps out. The girl sobs louder. It's just so, so beautiful. Iris sets her guitar aside. Where did you come from? Petrie X. The girl sounds ashamed. Iris stares at the curve of her neck. Perfect, unflawed. She's removed her surgically implanted auditory phone. Wires dangle daintily from her ear. Iris disconnected her own phone the last time she sneaked out. Iris would purr her name if she knew it. I've never met another CRAP. The girl's eyelids flutter. I hear there are more like us up here, hiding in prehistoric strip malls. She moves her arms, revealing a tear in the front of her uniform where she'd severed her feeding tube. Are you hungry? Iris asks. The girl appears starved. She nods. I'm Lily. Iris lifts the top half of her wetsuit and unwinds her feeding line. It swells like a miniature inner tube. She licks the end before inserting it through the tear in Lily's uniform, gently working it into her navel clamp, allowing life juices to flow into Lily. Lily giggles at the wetsuit. You look like a victim of pyrotechnics, Iris hiccups. Iris and Lily meet like this each night in the mangled milieu of glass, steel, and concrete that was once museums, libraries, and video arcades. Iris plays guitar. Lily paints, using the old world technique of fresco. Tons of plaster litters the ground, so no problem there. Iris watches her separate areas with a flat knife and sketch sensual curves of landscapes on the rough surfaces. Scenes of fertile fields and swelling seas, bucolic places they'll never see, smell, or touch. Lily lulls Iris with tales of paintbrushes woven from her hair and tints mixed from tears. I tried state-sanctioned art, Lily says with a lazy stroke, adding color to an otherwise colorless world. We were required to replicate the classics from ancient books. Mine were exact copies, but I was a slave, crippled inside. Iris understands. So you ran away? Do you think we have mothers, fathers, sisters, or brothers other than those in the lab? Lily asks, chewing the end of her brush. I once dreamed of being excavated from the belly of a wailing woman. I had the same dream. They only want us to know what they want us to know. Lily resumes painting. I prefer high Renaissance art to 20th century soup cans, don't you? Uh, sure. Lily's pet rat, Michelangelo, perches on her shoulder. His tail brushes the hollow between Lily's breasts. Iris has to look away. Imagine spending years lying upward, painting a ceiling, Lily says. So long ago. Yet his images tell the history of creation and the fall of humanity. If only we were allowed to study that. What do you think happened to all the books? Did you know Michelangelo wrote sonnets before Shakespeare? Lily recites. I feel as lit by fire a cold countenance that burns me from afar. I feel two shapely arms without motion moves every balance. Where did you learn that? 
Iris asks. An elder. Iris marvels at the way great thoughts seep from Lily's mind. I'll set it to music. We can't keep meeting here, Lily says her voice no longer frail, gaining strength from the nightly injections. We need a place that's ours alone. The universe dropped perfect crap in her junk pile. They have the same thoughts at the same time, like all lovers. Luxurious nights pass in secrecy above ground. Lily grinds plaster and mixes pigment in preparation for their journey. Being together like this is rare, almost like freedom. Iris tunes her guitar to Lily's heartbeat. The frequency bolsters her for the uncertainties that lie ahead. She packs essentials, antiseptic swabs, to clean her feeding tube, and the box of Super Strike bowling alley matches she found, worth a fortune on the black market. An ancient hubcap becomes a second bicycle seat. When it's time to set off, Iris slips the top half of her extra wetsuit over Lily's ragged uniform to blend with the darkness. If only... Lily stops. Iris understands completely. No one can be wholly beautiful in state-issued shoes. Guaranteed ugly for life. She steps from her boots. Wear these. Lily smiles, lovely as a cellulose rose. They travel under a moonless sky. No stars, no asteroids. Only dust particles and chemical pollutants extending into the atmosphere. They pass an enormous billboard. Fear the enemy. Deport, deport, deport. Do you think we can survive above ground? Lily keeps asking. Find a place away from the far-reaching spy balls? We won't stop until we discover one, Iris says. It's just a dream waiting to happen. Iris wants to say something equally brilliant, if only she had the words. But then... A conversation wasn't really necessary when two people agreed. No one had ever been so in tune with her, not even her Petri parents. Sure, they'll miss her, as she'll miss them. No doubt they developed a clone from her DNA, without the recessive crap gene. Her diagnosis had come in institutional daycare when her brain rejected the requisite digital chip. A month of interface examinations revealed a deadly allergy to mandated directives. Her QR tattoo scans, artistic, emotional. On the sixth day of their trek, Iris and Lily settle into the bowels of a toppled theme park in a moat where a decapitated Alice in Wonderland lolls in a cracked teacup. They hide during the day, foraging at night for anything useful hauling off smashed, broken, and bits of this and that. A miniature castle door becomes their front gate. They plant a plastic palm, add a garden flamingo. Scraps of wire mesh are woven into a dome roof in hopes of protecting them from drones. Michelangelo eliminates marauding rats, pulverizing spines and skulls, growing fat as a fabled cow. Lily tans the hides and stitches them together fabricating something called wall-to-wall -wall carpet. Meanwhile, they're in dire need of a tube feeding. Iris unearths a case of Cool Ranch Doritos, which had somehow survived the expiration date. A feast! Illustrious! Lily presses her lips to Iris's mouth. Iris loses herself in a primeval memory of vanilla and orange blossoms. Ours is the happiest place on earth, Lily says. Iris plays guitar, arranging words in an elaborate language. Lily works pigment into wet plaster, languishing over her latest fresco, Iris's song. Michelangelo gnaws on her toe. Iris shoos him away. Doesn't that hurt? Lily seems oblivious. What, my sweet? Your toe, Iris says. It's bleeding. Red, quick, fetch a receptacle. Soon the trees in Iris's song bloom scarlet. 
Iris never hungered for her more. They no longer talk about searching for other crap. Early one morning, Lily weeps over something she can't explain. Iris believes her tears are opalescent from the absorption of fluids through the feeding tube. It must have extra nutrients, she reasons, because Lily's breasts are overflowing with the same milky substance. Lily fashions a tent-like dress for herself. Rockabye baby on the treetop. Iris doesn't know if it's a song or a poem or how she knows the next line. When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. Summer heat rages and violent winds consume the crumbling ruins, sweeping away Lily's last morsel of plaster. She cries and cries, her tears raining on seething thermals. Iris repairs a broken-down cart for trek outward. I'll gather enough plaster to last forever after. Promise you'll come back to me. Her beautiful eyes gather Iris in and then cast her off. Iris itches inside her wetsuit. She pushes the cart into a twilight strange with colors, like someone sprayed everything gunmetal gray and thinks about her life with Lily, how she creates art from nothing, knowing no one but Iris will see it. Just as Iris writes songs, knowing no one but Lily will hear. She worries about Lily's swollen belly, fearing it's some sort of invasive growth. Instead of looking for plaster, she should be whisking Lily underground to a clinic. But that would mean turning themselves into the state. They'd be put on display, sealed in glass cubicles, separated forever. The windstorm slowly dies. Iris wheels the cart around debris, pausing near a pyramid of ash, where a mischief of rats groom themselves. All wear collars. It strikes her immediately. Domesticated. The implications leave her breathless. Pets or spies? No way to know. They stare at her through soulless eyes. Further on, Iris exhumes a chunk of moldy stucco, a thrilling moment since Lily doesn't have that shade of green. She leverages it into the cart, visualizing Lily's impish glee. Even in a wetsuit, Iris feels sticky leakage from her tube. The day's last night shakes a dusty haze. Near the moat, an unfamiliar smell assaults her, sweet and salty, but not unpleasant. The fragrance lulls her, pulls her the rest of the way home. Michelangelo hunches by the gate. Icor stains his whiskers. Iris rushes by him, seeing her lovely reclining and naked. A primitive and bleeding portrait. Lily! Lily smiles, cradling a wreathing bundle of flesh. It lets out a wail a cacophony of hope and promise. Iris kneels beside her family and serenades them with song. And welcome back to the studio. Wow, that was such a treat. I can't tell you how great it was to sit back and let someone else read me a story on the overcast. That was fantastic, ah. Uh, and I thought Kate's voice paired with Sherry's vision just perfectly. You know, Sherry has a, I would call it a post-apocalyptic dystopian fairy tale, really. Uh, it is, in fact, a hopeful story in the midst of a terrible situation. And I thought that Kate had a wonderful fairy tale-like reading. Uh, for us, and her voice just fit the tone of that piece absolutely perfectly. Uh, I'm so pleased, so pleased that we got to present both that story and that narration by Kate Tierney. Sherry Shahan was kind enough to provide an afterword for me to read to you. So without further ado, here it is, an afterword by Sherry Shahan. Before, I watched the world from behind, 
whether in the hub of Oxford, on a back street in Havana, or alone in a squat hotel room in Paris, whether with a 35mm camera or an iPhone. Today, I watch the world from behind windows in a laid-back beach town in California, where I grow carrot tops in ice cube trays for pesto. C.R.A.P. originally began as the first chapter of a novel, but I soon realized it would be rather gloomy to spend a couple of years in such a depressed world. As it turns out, 2020 has been just as distressing. My new novel, Purple Days, A Far Out Trip, 1965, was inspired by letters written by a friend who served in Vietnam in the late 1960s. Since letters inspired the story, I chose that form of expression for each character. Notes, journal entries, free verse, and traditional poetry. I'm currently gathering notes for a sequel to CRAP, a standalone short story that will follow Iris and Lily and their new daughter. I'm interested in exploring themes of value and purpose. Thank you, Sherry, for that enlightening afterword. I loved that your story was uh, a beacon of light uh, and a celebration of art and beauty and personal connection and love scratched out uh, in the face of a very gloomy, overbearing, dystopian world. In fact, I would say that's what I enjoy about dystopian worlds generally, is that they are, on the whole, hopeful stories. They are stories of, hey, the world's a terrible place, but we're going to focus on these characters who are fighting to do their best and to make it better. Uh, I find most dystopian stories are actually utopian stories at their heart. And uh, I think this story is uh, no different. For those of you listening at home, we'd really love to know your thoughts on that story. You can chime in on the website or on Facebook at Overcast Pod or tweet to us at NW Overcast. As I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, the Overcast would not exist without the continued generosity and support of our patrons. For just a dollar or two a month, yes, less than that cup of coffee you bought this morning, you can help keep bringing great speculative audio fiction into the world. If you're already a patron, thank you so much. Words cannot express my gratitude and the gratitude of our authors, whose art your generosity is making possible. If you would like to join our patrons, just go to patreon.com front slash overcast and sign up today. Thank you in advance. And even if you can't become a patron this month, you can still help us out by leaving a review on iTunes or Google Play or wherever you get your podcasts and help spread the word about the Overcast by tweeting about us or posting about us on social media or most importantly, telling your friends. Word of mouth is the number one most effective form of advertising, so if you enjoy the Overcast, tell your friends so that they can enjoy it as well. The Overcast is copyright 2021 by Words on the Wind, LLC. The music you're listening to is by Whip of the Swan. Thank you so much for listening to The Overcast. I'm your host and editor, J.S. Arquin. Until next time, have a breathtaking, story-filled week. Thank you.